respond to our talks about mycorrhiza bacteria today. Uh, does anybody have any other thoughts or questions they want to add before we move on? Dear God, thank you so much for this time together today. Um, you know the hearts, you know the journeys of everybody on the line today. Help us to live in a way uh, that we are reflective of your love and help us to be able to feel at home in situations that we haven't felt at home before because we can find ways to love others in the midst of difficulties and uh, things that had formerly led to discord and dis dissensions. We're thankful uh, for the opportunity you give us for today. Uh, we're thankful for the amazing wonder that there is in this natural world. We're thankful for these relationships and the detail that you've given us to craft a relationship uh, with the each and every one that we've been gifted to craft a relationship with. Amen. All right. So, we'll move on to Mac, micro, micro, microbial inoculants and organic amendments uh, to improve uh, plant establishment for stream restoration, ecological restoration projects. So, there's a paper that I sent out uh, last Wednesday to the group, uh, which summarizes this, and it's a master's degree paper, and uh, there's not a lot of information written on this, but it's a practice that is Emerge, emerging for heavily degraded situations. Um, so I don't know who's on the line today, but uh, one of the people on the line uh, had asked if I could kind of uh, emphasize what the River Shared is again. So I'm just going to say uh, River Shared is we're just a group of people and we're focused on sharing information and knowledge, sharing knowledge with humility. So sometimes we don't, when we're sharing these things, we don't always know exactly what the outcome is or it's not as polished as what it would be in a publication and then having patience and discernment for innovation advocate for excellence respect risk and uncertainties in the river systems empower challenge and question and then document unexpected results um, and the hope is that we can be a group that can share information and encourage more sharing throughout uh, the industry and at some point uh, you know, it will be more of an industry standard to find ways to share uh, to be able to make the industry better than to have proprietary information. So that's kind of a little bit of how the river shared that. So what I'm going to share with you is a project. It's I won't say it's overly innovative, but it's kind of innovative for our field because it's not something that we use too often in this field. So rhizobacteria and and Gina, or I don't know if anybody else on the line that's from a biology background, feel free to uh, uh, stop me and add anything if I get words wrong or if I say something incorrect. But I'll give you my best understanding of this, knowing that I'm not a biologist. So rhizobacteria, an amendment favor plant establishment in degraded soils. Uh, so that's kind of the, the emphasis of this outline. The treatments applied improved plant nutrient uptake. So the idea is that you can have a whole bunch of nutrients, but uh, if those nutrients aren't readily available in a way that they can be taken up by the plants, it doesn't matter if you have a block of sulfur up there and the plants need sulfur or a block of calcium up there and the plants need calcium, they're not going to get calcium unless there's some way to break it down to make it available to the plants. And usually that comes in weathering uh, and then it comes in through the transformation of the biochemistry uh, with the biology that are near the root hairs uh, to make different nutrients available for uptake. Uh, soil quality parameters were distinctly enhanced by the treatments and their combinations and the application of sugar beets and, and rhizoma bacteria could be feasible strategy for land reclamation. So the idea is can we we want to have uh, rhizobacteria, but are there ways that we can get this without uh, having to pour a whole bunch of uh, magical snake oil concoction bottle stuff onto a field? Are there other ways that we can grow agricultural things to help stimulate this? So 
you know, what I learned growing up is, uh, we're going to move to the next slide. What I learned growing up is how to grow a plant. You will need seeds, soil, plant pot, and watering can. You know, and so that's kind of how simple it was for me growing up. This is how I grow a plant. And then you can hit the over button, and then it will show that the what I've learned through a little bit of an experience in uh, plant physiology and and then uh, working with other people that are a lot smarter about biology is that it's a lot more complicated than just you need seeds, soils, plant pot, and watering can. Uh, and the plant microbiome essentially says, okay, what does it look like? for that biosphere right near the plant roots and how do we get different nutrients to be uptake? And we know that we can add a fertilizer, but how does that fertilizer even get to the plant? Uh, if you will, we know when there's food on the table, we know how that gets to our stomachs, we eat it. But how does that work for a plant? How do we get plants to be able to absorb uh, nutrients through their roots? Uh, and so we'll move to the next slide and uh and this slide I just labeled more small things that I don't really understand. Uh so <laughs> the soil food diagram web this talks about all the different uh fungi and um and and how roots interact with getting different uh organic material and how they can get nutrients from different materials and where where the food comes from. So this is kind of the idea of, okay, this is how you get food into your mouth, and this is, you can process it, you can put it in a food processor, or you can put it in a blender, uh, or you can just cut it with a knife. And so this is kind of trying to tell you how some of these different biological activities can make uh, nutrients available for plants. and. There, if we have an interest in this type of stuff, we'll add it. We'll talk about it later. What I want to emphasize to most of the people that don't come from a biological background is that it's it's not as simple as just uh, you know having water, a seed, a plant pot, and a watering can. You know, so um, soil microorganisms live in association with plant roots and excrete nutrients and sticky substances. So the idea is if these microorganisms stick to plant root uh, and they're excreting nutrients, then they're right near the plant root and that sticky substance can take those nutrients up into the plant root and then it can absorb to the uh, plant root and the plant root can take them, can uptake them into the plant, to the leaves and uh, to the stems and everything else and grow. Uh, so uh, these are a couple of neat uh, uh, photos of very small things, you know, mycorrhizal, fungi, and plant roots. So we're going to move on to the next slide where we're talking about the food web pyramid in one square meter of soil. Um, and this talks about all the different number, and this is just to show you that, hey, there's a whole lot of really small things we can't see, uh, bacteria, uh, and then you have uh, protozoa, and then you still can't see them, but there's a lot of them. And then you have uh, nematodes, which are still pretty small and you can't see. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them as well, but there's orders of magnitude different. As you can see from the bacteria, I don't even know what number that is. It's in the millions, billions, trillions, 10 trillions maybe. Uh, sounds like the national debt. Um, and then, you know, so you can see these order of magnitude differences. Then we get up to things that we can start to see, um, and you know whether you can see springtails and mites. Generally, you can usually see mites, but you don't always know what they are because uh, you can't see their legs. But definitely, when it comes to the insect size in one meter of soil, there's you know, it could be five thousand uh, different insects in there, and then you may have one vertebrate sitting at the top of this. Uh, one little piper just kind of pecking and trying to eat food from there. Uh, so the idea is there's a lot living in soil, um, but sometimes there's not a lot living in soil. Uh, so the idea is, well, maybe to get things started to live, maybe we just need to add stuff at the bottom of the pyramid. And as we add stuff at the bottom of the pyramid, then we'll be able to get the rest of the stuff to grow. 
and maybe the soil is so bad if we can just add some sort of magical concoction uh it will it will you know grow our hair back and then we'll be able to be fine or you know you just add this and then everything's going to be magical and this is this idea of microbial inoculants so i first ran into this uh in 1999 um i just graduated from penn state university and uh i had a degree in agricultural and biological engineering and i went to work for michael baker corporation in gary indiana or maryville indiana and i was working in gary indiana in the u.s steel corporation and we had a bop slag landfill closure that we were working on and bop slag is bot is the best bessemer oxidation process and this is a process where you take sulfur calcium and uh iron ore together you heat it really really hot and then you hit it with uh, different you you hit it with a spray of water and then it will settle out the calciums uh, sulfur and other impurities and then you'll it's a way to get the impurities out of the ore and then what you have left is a steel uh, product that then you can melt and form into things to build buildings and everything else. So it's a part of the steel make, making process. And um, it might be that if Brad Fairley is on the line, he could add more to that if anybody's interested. But um, the idea is that you have this slag left over that doesn't look anything like a soil, but yet they're landfilling it. And we have to try to get something to grow on it. Because uh, for the closure of landfill, there has to be a vegetative cover, uh, but yet you're have to try to create a soil out of something that was never was never really a soil to begin with. So it reminds me of the cartoon Wally, -E, where Wally -E and Eve go around trying to find a plant in this uh, post-destructive world where you know everybody's had to move on, away from the world because they've made it so messy and there's no plants grown and Eve finds this plant. Um, so. Gary, Indiana, uh, the idea is we wanted to have closure uh, of this landfill, but we need to get vegetation for closure of this landfill. Um, and closure of Gary, Indiana, it's kind of not exactly a nice, it's, you know, it's considered one of America's most abandoned cities, uh, not, not the most pretty place to live. Uh, but we wanted to try to find a way to close out this landfill uh, and be able to get revegetation on it. So. If you will, we wanted to find that one plant that was growing there and find a way to encourage more plants to grow. So this is a picture of aerial photo of southern Lake Michigan in Gary, Indiana. Everything that looks discolored is part of the U.S. Steel Corporation. Uh, really anything north of Interstate 90 is part of the U.S. Steel Corporation. They have built the steel mill almost one mile into Lake Michigan and they build it on top of slag material from the steel making process. So that means underneath that one, approximately one mile into the river, into the uh, Lake Michigan, there was no ground before. They've just basically filled in the lake uh, over the years um, with slag material and then built buildings and processing plants on top of that. So it's a heavily degraded system. And uh, the little square over here, uh, the yellow square that you see, is the uh, BOP landfill. And the BOP landfill, Bessemer oxidation process, uh, we'll zoom into that. Uh, this is from 1998, uh, before the restoration. This is till 2000, 2020, so I just pulled up the aerial photography uh, the other day. And the whole idea is we were trying to get vegetation to establish but this fine slag uh, does not have organic material and does not have the bacteria that's available uh, to create uh, a way for plants to uptake the nutrients. It had a lot of sulfur and it had a lot of calcium, uh, but we needed to add organic material and we needed to add uh, some sort of uh, biological inoculant just to get everything started out here so that was my first 
connection to these inoculants. We have a couple projects that are coming up here uh, potentially soon where we're looking at the use of inoculants to stimulate the growth in places where we've lost a lot of topsoil and where we've had heavily degraded sites. So in a lot of places uh, to get revegetation on normal fins, this idea of the inoculants probably not something that's overly useful. It might be a little bit of a waste of money, but there are some heavily degraded sites where the soils have been so disturbed uh, that it might be worthwhile to have inoculants come out. And one of the things that I would recommend is the most extension services will allow you uh, to do soil test, will allow you a really low cost soil test in, in different states. And if you do the soil test and you can get uh, you can get tests for chemistry. You can also get tests for biology, and that can give you a starting point of okay, well, is is it just or do we not have stuff growing on this degraded site because we have a problem with a uh, um, biological level of the microbes, and do we need to inoculate it, or do we not have things growing uh, because of some other soil chemistry issue, and we can just add some lime or we can add some fertilizer to it, and that would be just fine. Uh, so. It's a tool for the toolbox. It is not a magic silver bullet. I would never recommend it. Uh, as you may have noticed uh, in the picture where I showed it to you where they're holding a can, a bottle of this, uh, it's, in, it's very expensive to buy this inoculant. Uh, and it's not something where you just want to buy it and pour it all over a big site uh, unless you know there's no other option. So. Those are some thoughts today about uh, uh, microbial inoculants. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts or things they want to share this morning? I think, Dave, it's important to note that the um, inoculants that you're talking about in a typical home com compost pile, all those little components naturally occur. And so the bottle that you showed is basically the distillation so that you only have those little communities in that bottle to spread around. Um, fertilizer itself does not establish the, the communities that plants need to uptake those nutrients. So you're right in saying that, you know, do we put fertilizer down? And fertilizer assumes that we already have those networks established in the plant communities in the soil. Uh, if you have them, great. But if you don't, then you're going to have to use the more expensive treatment, certainly. And the other thing I want to loop back around, this is why I love biology. No offense, engineers, but this is why I love biology. <laughs> <laughs> it goes back to your prayer that you were praying at the end of the first part of the presentation. And that is, nothing is simple. God has made everything so incredibly intricate. I am always totally in awe at the small little communities that plants depend on to take up nutrients. And so, you know, getting the inoculants, if you really, it comes down to a question, do the plants that are there, have they already established the types of soil connections that they need to uptake nutrients? And if they have, fertilizer will work. My daughter who works at an organic greenhouse right now would totally argue with that. But um, but if you don't have it, like you had up in Gary, Indiana, which has come a long way from the Music Man, um, <laughs> you don't have it there, and you're trying to get plants to grow, you're right. You've got to have those inoculants. You've got to get something organic into the system. And I would argue in those systems, like in Gary, the inoculants are one thing they will work, but you also have to get the organic matter, the compost involved too. So that's, that's my cliff note version of what you just presented from my standpoint. Gina, this is Josh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Um, so standard stream restoration project in an urban environment. Uh, the contractor is, is, he likes to cut trees. We, we try to do our soft touch, but all this to say they, they treat it like an industrial site. And there's a, you know, a large scale clearing and then the, 
you, you know, we're trying to put provisions for, for topsoil stripping and trying to uh, create incentives for the contractor to salvage topsoil as opposed to furnishing. But still, we, you know, it, it might turn out that the, in the contractor's favor that, you know, we have these minerally, uh, you know, biologically low productive soils. My question is, ha have we experimented with these um, additives, these amendments on those environments as well with these products? And well, it's kind of success, yeah. This, this is all, it's kind of a new field for me, Josh. I understand the biology behind it, but as far as the research and application, I haven't done a ton of reading yet. My gut feeling, and this is only my gut feeling, this is not necessarily published, is that if you're, you've got the topsoil that things have been growing on anyway, then some, even though it may de be degraded, some of those rhizomial communities um, will still be there. And so if, you, if they have the organic nutrients, you know, it, it might be a situation where you have the topsoil, but because it's slightly degraded, but there's possibility that there's still the communities in there, that you can mix it with some compost and then apply it and then put your plantings on top of that. And so we're not really we're not. worked at water quality in Oklahoma. I can tell you that adding fertilizer, you know, it's just gonna run off sometimes. So you can over fertilize. You really need to make sure that your soil is living and it's viable. And that's the better way ecologically to go. What do we call it when we keep doing the same thing, expecting different results? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, in particular, the, the topsoil stripping and, and salvaging and repurposing, it, it, we're only having mixed, uh, you know, mixed results with the contractors in, engaging that avenue. So that's why I was curious about this product I'm, uh, and types of products. I'd be really, uh, you know, excited to get, you could get a lot of free data points if we could, if we could get some of that, you know, into some of our bigger clients doing a variety of projects. You know, these municipalities would probably love to get their vegetation experts on board. Well, you know, we all kind of have our own specialties. And, uh, you know, I know <laughs> biologists in the world are kind of thought of a little bit as bunny huggers, but that's because we kind of appreciate everything that's going on. And yet, um, on some of our projects, I've been known as a tree hugger. But, you know, contractors, on the other hand, may or may not understand salvaging that topsoil. They, they kind of know why they're doing it, but they don't understand the biology of what they're doing. And so I really think in our, in our world and the, peop the people that we come in contact with on these projects, a little bit of education goes a long way. We don't have to overdo it. We don't have to get really technical. But as long as they understand why they're doing it and how they probably ought to do it, um, I think it'd be more, they'd be more effective at doing a better job of it. I think even if we look at costs of, of some of these treatments, uh, it can also be something that encourage contractors to do a better job uh, because it's not cheap. Um, and it's a little bit, it's a little bit cheaper than hauling in topsoil in some locations, but it's a very expensive product. Uh, so for us to look at these uh, situations and even put them into in bidding documents, say, okay, well, okay, well, if you can't salvage topsoil, this is a mitigation method that you can use. Uh, but then they can look into the cost of it and can encourage them to harvest topsoil. Um, but it's it's a tool that's out there. By no means is it a, a silver bullet. I've used it on. Uh, I've recommended it for one other project on a landfill project in New York uh, a number of years ago, but then the only other project I've ever used it on was in 1999. Uh, and when it came to uh, the use of the, you know, that project, we really emphasized uh, getting a compost out there uh, for the organic amendment uh, before we ever even thought about the mycorrhiza. We just couldn't get enough compost out there and we wanted to try to get something else to help stimulate the soil and if you see the 2020 era photography you can still see that we don't have a dense community of vegetation 
it's enough for vegetated cover to be successful based on their regulatory standards, but it sure hasn't made a uh, great dent in a, in a, you know, it doesn't look like a big field for sure. You wouldn't harvest anything off of this. Um, so. you, you can liken some of these um, conditions like you found up in Gary, Indiana, Dave, with going to Walmart in the last few months and being totally t sold out of toilet paper and tissue and paper towel. <laughs> That's how the plants feel. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, well, and it's, uh, you know, Gary, Indiana was very unique because their soils weren't soils. They, n they never were soils. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> most of it was, were, were different minerals that were harvested, blasted together, uh, and then created some sort of a, uh, uh, a combined uh, mixture uh, that was pulverized by water forces, so then it made a fine grain granular material. Uh, but just the EPA allowing U.S. Steel to even do that, the reason they allowed them is... The reason they allowed them to do it is because the... Uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, the cost of doing it otherwise was so expensive, and uh, Gary Indiana Steel Corporation at the time was not in good financial situations. So that's kind of the reason why it was allowed uh, to do it. Is kind of like, okay, well, we're going to give you an opportunity that's better than you just building a new process and plant on top of this flag. If you can get it vegetated and closed. So it's it's you know a different situation, but I do think that. Uh, we have a, some projects we're looking at right now where we may evaluate the use of mycorrhiza bacteria inoculants, and I want people to be aware of what it is and reach out to the correct people, opposed to just think it's a miracle uh, uh, snake oil that's going to fix everything for us. So. All right. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, have a great week. Uh, I'll probably have a great week, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. All right. Have a good one, Dave. Hey, th thanks a lot, Gina. Thanks for thanks for uh, I, I have been... Welcome. Thanks, Gina. Thanks, Dave. Oh, you're Yay. very welcome. See you at the conference. <laughs>